Hi, um, joined here with Wendy Merrick from Juma. Um, thank you for joining us, Wendy. Uh, thank you for joining our uh, In Conversation series. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you. Would you like just to give us a brief introduction of who you are and uh, tell us a little about yourself and Juma? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation, Andy. Uh, it's lovely to chat to you. So I'm Wendy Merrick. So I'm the CEO of Juma group. Uh, we have Jumar Technology and we have Jumar uh, Recruitment. So I have two businesses within, within the group. Uh, my background is uh, technology services. I've worked 39 years in the IT services sector and I started Jumar back in 1999. So we're in our 21st year. Uh, so these, this COVID situation has ruined our 21st birthday plans uh, for this year. So. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's something, isn't it? 21 years, that's fantastic. And I guess the, um, for a lot of people who've, had, who've, who've got birthdays and had to come up with new plans and, and find new ways to do it, COVID has been a real disruption for us. And uh, yeah, how, in general, has it impacted your business? Um, well, I, I think, like any business, there's been um, positives and there's been negatives. So in true um, style, I'll start with sort of the things that have probably not been quite so good. Um, so in the main, um, on the recruitment side, we've had um, quite a few clients that have put their permanent recruitment on hold. Now, a number of them have put their contract recruitment on hold as well. So that's had quite an impact on the recruitment business because the flow of roles and vacancies coming in um, from a services perspective has, um, has dropped uh, quite considerably. Um, and on the, the same on the technology side, um, we've, um, we've got quite a number of projects that are still in flow and those where they are mid flow were fine and they're carrying on. Um, we've had a, one project that uh, we were due to start in March um, that has been put back until maybe July, August or when the, when the shutdown um, comes to an end. And then we've had a couple of projects where they've come to a natural end of a phase and they've not cancelled the project, but they want to put them on hold until um, they've got more staff available because not only have we furloughed some employees on the recruitment side because the flow of roles has disappeared, but some of our clients have furloughed their employees as well, which has meant the user community that we need to deal with from a project perspective and not there for us to progress the projects. So, so negatively, we've seen a downturn um, in the business. Um, and also, it, it, our beginning of the financial year is the 1st of April and so there's a potential that we won't see the growth in quarter one that we were hoping to see. Um, I can't even think to, pre to predict quarter two at the moment. Um, a couple of months in it's looking okay at the moment we're managing to um, sort of keep things um, as the status quo as it was um, so I think for the for the year the forecast is probably going to be affected somehow we can all as business owners just keep fingers crossed that um, quarter three and quarter four will make up for the deficit potentially in, in quarter one um, and, and then just the final one really from a negative perspective is that you know we did have to make the decision to furlough some people um, not for any other reason than they, they just, we just hadn't got the work to give them and and the challenge there is keeping them motivated keeping them feeling like they're still a valued member of the team so we've been doing lots and lots of things which I could talk about later um, to motivate and keep them feeling um, a part of the team so communication has been really key over the last sort of couple of months um, from a positive, because I am a cup half full kind of person. Um, so there's been quite a few uh, positives, really. Um, um, and really, it's about the remote working for us. Um, I used to struggle a little bit with, you know, the whole company, you know, sort of working from home and this whole concept of flexible working. There's always that worry that you think your productivity is going to drop. Um, uh, and so we whilst we on the technology they're very used to working from home but from a recruitment perspective they very much worked in the office 
uh, all of our offices as a unit and tended to work together in pods um, to work in specific sectors. So we've had to break all of that up. Everybody's working from home, but it's been fantastic. The camaraderie, the teamship, my management team, it's been a really, really positive experience. And, you know, we communicate much more now than when we were in the office. And so we've, we're, we're doing a lot of things around lessons learned, what's worked really well, which obviously I've talked about, you know, what has not worked well. Um, you know, and everybody really stepped up and responded really well. And people who you wouldn't expect to have done that um, have really surprised us all, you know, from a really positive perspective. So I'm really delighted to do that. Um, on the technology side, um, where some of the projects are either slowing up or there isn't as much work, um, you know, the developers in particular are having time to do a lot more training, getting all of those certifications that, that they all want under their belt um, ready. Um, those on furlough, uh, we've invested quite a bit in training material for both recruitment and technology to do as much recruit uh, to do as much training as they feel they want to do um but unlike some companies we've not made it mandatory it, it is obviously nice if they do do some training because it makes them feel connected with the business i do know some companies um have made it a mandatory requirement which um i don't know i, I for me it feels furlough is furlough you, you you're not required to work so doing the training i think should be down to the individual um to choose yeah. um uh, one of the other final ones really is uh, from a positive perspective we've realized that we don't need to spend half of our life on planes on trains and jumping in a car and doing all of these face-to-face -face meetings that we've done the, you know the, the the Microsoft Teams meetings that we've done, all the Zoom meetings that we've done. Um, I've just been really, it's just been really good, um, just as effective, keeping the meetings, you know, probably a bit more concise than you would do, um, and you haven't got the hour, two hours of of commute either side to, just to attend a meeting. Um, we've saved a significant amount of money in train fares. Um, and and you know flights alone um, and so one of the things we're looking at as a management team now is we really need to do that when we go you know when we come out the other side of the lockdown I think it's made us realize that there is a, a, a better way of working and so I think we'll probably be doing our bit for the environment by the time we get to the end of this so uh -huh. so good and bad but I would say more good than than bad I, I think what you're saying is is really interesting and it's something I've heard from a number of uh, business leaders as well talking about their businesses and how they, they're adjusting. Uh, I think it's fascinating to hear how people are beginning to uh, adjust to that remote working, how uh, actually it's not been as difficult as people uh, first thought it might be. Um, yes, there have had to be some some hard decisions on furloughing um, but it feels to me like that, and, and from what you're saying, that with, with these challenges, there are new opportunities. New opportunities, not just in terms of business opportunities and new business relationships, but also in terms of the way that we work and the way that we um, explore uh, how we do things. And, um, and I think we're a, we're a pretty resilient people, so we tend to find, um, you know, find it interesting to explore new ways of working. Um, and it sounds to me like um, you have uh, embraced those those new opportunities. I mean, in terms of your your business development effort, have you seen shifts and changes in landscape uh, in the business development um, opportunities that you've been exploring? And how have you approached that? Um, yeah, business development. Um, uh, again, it's been it's been sort of tricky in terms of new business development because. Um, morally, um, I don't really want the, the business development team sort of doing cold approaches. Um, and of course, the business development team are quite used to um, having target accounts and, and making approaches um, in whatever guise that might be. 
Um, and at the moment, we know that um, business leaders and, and management teams have got more important things to be uh, worrying about than having, you know, salespeople knocking on their door. However, you know, the businesses still have to move, move on. And, you know, a number of our clients have still got projects they want to do. Um, we spent the first sort of probably four to six weeks supporting not only existing clients, but, um, you know, target clients that we were approaching, just asking them how they were doing, how are you faring, realising that quite a lot of them were having issues with communication, connectivity, um, some organisations had really not embraced homeworking before. Um, and so we ran a couple of times a week, um, lots of seminars, either individually for clients or doing, you know, sort of group um, calls, um, quickly running some workshops to, to give them all the how to's on um, finding their way around Microsoft Teams or SharePoint or, or Zoom um, in order to get them working together um, effectively um, as a team. And I think from a business development perspective, that will hold us in good stead, hopefully for the future, because they can see that we, you know, we, we offered a helping hand at the time. Um, but I think all of those kind of collaboration tools um, are going to be really important um, moving forward and um, through our technology division where we can work with all of these um, clients uh, through either consultancy or, you know, providing um, our um, experts on demand to sort of support them in these. Um, you know, we're going, we're going to help these clients sort of manage, you know, their backlogs and their, and their workflow um, and, and help them to look at more innovative ways of optimising their workforce as well. Um, we're working with one client in particular at the moment um, where, you know, they are evaluating now the, the workforce they have and how they could actually sort of make better use, have better value out of their employees and looking at where the, where the pockets of work are across the organisation. Instead of one person, they just do their job in solo. Um, you know, that person um, could probably be, be used in another department as well. So yep. you've got some efficiencies. So I think... Um, I think that's that sort of a business development um, perspective. Um, and I think also with having a large team of our own permanent staff on the technology side um, and proving that we can work flexibly and remotely um, has you know, outsourcing some of their development or you know, some of their sort of support um, is something that doesn't sort of feel so um, alien to them now that actually it's something that's quite natural. So I think it's actually made life a lot easier for our business development team. Um, so I'm hoping that through keeping the contact going and making sure that we're, we're just there, keeping in touch, you know, how you're feeling, how you're faring. Um, and then when we hear that there is an issue or a challenge with something, then we can just respond accordingly and hopefully then when we get to quarter two onwards we can sort of start to see maybe a u-shaped return um out of this situation and uh hopefully then still have a better year as a business yeah and and i'm assuming uh, i mean again something that i've heard coming up in conversation is is how there's been a real wake-up call uh, in regards to digital transformation how companies have uh, may have been a little slow um, and not quite ready um, for, 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 for these kind of what you might call a black swan type event. Um, yeah. Now, these are quite rare events, but they, you know, as we've seen, they've, they've happened. And there are all sorts of other disruptors that can, can, can go on through our lives uh, and affect business. Digital transformation is, is, has been historically uh, something to embrace um, for those who want to move with the times. And uh, how do you think there's an opportunity now for technology service businesses to, you know, with this new landscape, with this changing uh, emphasis and uh, willingness of, of businesses to embrace digital transformation to, to, to really um, uh, build new relationships and push technology forward? I, th I think so. And I think a num one of the areas of specialisation for us is legacy modernisation and supporting customers. 
through their uh, digital transformation and taking them on their journey uh, to the cloud. And we talk with hundreds of customers where the, you know, the, the IT department, you know, are keen to do it but the business are not keen to actually invest sure. in what they need to do. Um, but obviously that's going to have a shift change now, isn't it? Um, because those that hadn't embraced their digital technology roadmap um, have in some respects probably caught a bit of a cold because they were a bit, bit slower to catch up. Um, I mean, we do, um, you know, we have uh, DR um, exercises and, and by, sheer coincidence we did a full dr um run through early in february not we had no prediction of anything like this happening yeah. um but we just decided to do one because if i'm honest we did one last year and it didn't run as smoothly as we would have liked so we did a whole company one um in february and um it, it was just it all worked absolutely fine so as soon as the lockdown happened we actually closed our office um, two days before the government made it mandatory. We just decided that our employees, we had a couple of vulnerable employees um, that had had, you know, organ transplants and things like that. And so we decided we didn't want to take the risk uh, with everybody, let alone a couple of people. And so we decided to close down the office because we knew we'd already done it. Um, I know that a lot of clients um, were not in a position uh, to do that and some of them had not even rolled out um, laptop technology across their business uh, because everyone uh, was so used to just going into the office and working. Um, but we've supported some of those clients with um, getting enabled. So that's where we see the spike really. And, and even now, eight weeks into the lockdown, we're starting to um, have conversations with clients where this has now come right to the top of the list and is now just on a it's not just on a wish list anymore but it has come right to the to the top of the list so I think for the technology sector um, we should see probably a quicker recovery but mm. of course none of us have got a crystal ball have we we don't know we don't know how deep a recession potentially um, we're going to go into but I think businesses need that need to survive and that's going to whatever they decide to do it will involve technology and yeah. it's a case of us as a business having those relationships with those clients to make sure that you know we're there to support them and hopefully you know win those uh, win those packages of work um so lots of um lots of clients are uh, spending time right now re revisiting their strategy yeah yeah. In fact, in a couple of weeks' time, we're we're holding um, a round table and inviting CIOs, CTOs to the round table event to to talk about what has changed in their business. How does this now change their strategy? Does it change the order of priority? Um, would they do anything differently? Are they going to accelerate anything? So mm. I'm really excited about that, and you know I'm I'm hoping that we'll get some insights through talking to you know CTOs and CIOs from across lots of different industry sectors to see whether they're all thinking the same or whether they you know um, whether they can sort of support each other in a different way of thinking yeah yeah and are you seeing um, changes in terms of the uh, I guess the technology resourcing landscape um, around the you know the changes in in COVID nineteen. You know we've seen uh, a big drop off um, in terms of recruitment, but have you seen uh, any changes starting to happen now in terms of um, you know we've we've adjusted in behaviours of working. How is that going to change our attitudes to hiring and how how we um, how we hire in the future? Well, we've, we've been doing a lot of talking about this um, internally because as a technology and a recruitment business, um, whichever way it goes, it's either going to benefit one, maybe not benefit the other. But what we're trying to do is, is to move forward so that it does benefit both um, sides of the business. If we do go into a deep recession, I think permanent recruitment will be slow to recover um, for this year. I don't think 
unless they've got deep pockets. I don't think clients are necessarily going to be going out and hiring large numbers of, of tech people, um, certainly for this year, I don't think. But mm. this whole concept of this flexible and remote working opens up new opportunities to clients. Um, Nearshore, um, Nearshore Resources um, becomes more attractive. Um, they've got access now to a global workforce, not just a local onshore workforce. Um, yeah. And so, um, so I think it will change. Mm. When you come out of any recession, nothing's ever the same, is there? No. And I think what you find in a recession is that the um, sort of, I think it's a bit like the pecking order changes a little bit um, in that, you know, maybe when you went into it, the big boys, um, your big SIs, Maybe they had more of the market share. But what I think some of our clients are going to be looking for is they're going to be looking for those niche players. They're going to be looking at these tech startup businesses that have come up with something really innovative to automate a part of their business where they probably need less dependency on resource heavy solutions. Um, so I think, I think, that's an area where it's going to change. But also, I think the main thing really is access to a more global workforce because you may need, I mean, we've got, we've got clients that, that we, they have a certain skill set and it's almost like it's a permanent requirement with that client that if you come across a candidate that has this particular skill set, um, they'll always be interested in having a look. At, but it's because they always want that person here in the UK, in the area where they work. So, you know, they've restricted themselves on, on the, the, you know, the workforce that's available to them. Maybe now that they've gone through a situation like this, um, if they can get the, um, the management, the governance and the processes right in their business, which is something that we've invested a lot of money on um, with working with nearshore, offshore partners. And we have a development centre in Australia as well. So your governance, your processes and your management of your people. Right. I don't think it matters whether your employee is sitting in Birmingham, Manchester, London or Mumbai, Sydney, California. You know, I just don't think it, I don't really think it matters. So I think, I think we're looking at quite a change and it's, mm. to be honest, Andy, it's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Exciting. And, um, and do you see that uh, um, this, this idea of uh, the remote, the increase in remote working, um, the, the, like you said earlier, the, the fact that travel will perhaps become less emphasized um, it will it will mean that the traditional ways that we meet and network will, could change as well. Lots more webinars, lots more kind of interaction yeah. online. But how much have you learned over the last eight weeks from attending lots of webinars? I mean, obviously, we've all got COVID-19 advice on how to run your business and how to run your workforce coming out of your ears, haven't you? Um, but but. Putting that to one side, just generally from a business perspective and the calls we've been having, um, the communication is just so much clearer. Mm. Um, it's much easier to get people on video conferencing. I and mean, one of the things that we've been working on the last sort of couple of years is trying to persuade clients from a recruitment perspective to do less face-to-face -face interviewing anyway. There's, we, you know, we have... Um, you know, a video interviewing uh, tool where you can see the CV, you can see the candidate. Um, and, you know, as they're listening to us interviewing the candidate, you know, they could be scrolling down the CV and that should take, should save so much time. Um, but it's, it's, it's been embraced in some clients, but it's been, it's been very difficult to get off the ground. Um, and even now, some clients are still a little bit reluctant to continue with their recruitment um, and do the um, remote uh, interviewing and the remote onboarding. We have had some that have done um, the remote interviewing and onboarding. Yeah. And for those clients that we're still busy with, um, they're still hiring, but, and they're hiring really good quality people. They have more resources available because they're still hiring and lots of others have put their recruitment on, on hold. 
Um, and obviously with the projects being put on hold, there's not so much recruitment being done around te technology um, projects. Um, but those that have continued to keep their business running as normal and have embraced the new technology way of getting people on board, well, they're mopping up on good people. Mm, yeah. On the, on the uh, opposite side of that, though, um, what we have noticed is that some candidates are staying put because even though prior to the lockdown, they were actively looking and were registered with us and said, I want a new role. Now that the lockdown has happened, it's better the devil you know. They've not been furloughed. They're being paid. They're working from home. The danger is they could accept a role, give notice, but just before they're due to start, they'll have their offer put back or, you know, or stopped if, if the company's circumstances change. So it's just this balancing act of, mm -hmm. of getting it right. So, um, but I know for sure in our business, um, we won't return back to how we were before. There will be a new world for us and how we will work. Uh, me personally, I've absolutely loved spending more time working from home. I've not really been one um, for working from home, um, but now that I've done it and done it for such a long time, I, it's almost like I've forgotten what it was like to go to the office every day because I really enjoy just just coming here and, and, and working in my little office at the bottom of the garden. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, I mean, that, that is something that we've all had to uh, get used to. And I think it will be a slight adjustment when we all suddenly start going back to offices. Um, <laughs> do yeah. you, um, I mean, one of the things that's, that Amdaris, Amdaris we're very passionate about is, is women in IT. And I know you're a, a big advocate of women in IT. And as a, as a, as a woman and business leader, how do you support women developing their careers and uh, encouraging them to, to embrace the opportunities ahead of them? Yes, it is, it is something I'm passionate about because there's not many of us um, at CEO level. Obviously, there are more and um, with the gender pay gap and everything, you know, it, it is getting a lot better. In yeah. tech, we've still got quite a long way to go. Um, so, we are members of women in tech we attend quite a few um conferences like women of silicon roundabout in in london obviously all of those have been cancelled this year um however a number of them are, are doing lots of round tables and and things like that so um you know really trying to sort of stay involved within the community wherever we can um I'm a mem I'm sort of a member of a number of um, organisations. So I'm a member of the, as a previous EY Entrepreneur of the Year um, finalist, um, I'm now part of an alumni group, um, which is mixed, but then they've sort of in the last six months um, built a, a female entrepreneurs um, business owner group mm -hmm. and we're now we used to meet up about every three months or so but now we're all we're all dialing in every week and we're all having a glass of wine and and chatting and we're all supporting each other and it's you know we're all having the same challenges and we're all having the same opportunities and things like that but actually we're all starting to collaborate with each other now and it's really good to see um, I'm also the chairwoman of the um, APSCO um, West Midlands region. APSCO is the um, membership um, body for recruitment professionals. So they give us a lot of advice and they've been superb. So um, through that, um, I support a number of um, other female leaders within the recruitment um, sector as well. Um, and um, I've just gone into um, a mentoring program on the recruitment side. We have mentoring within Juma, so we have, you know, sort of quite an even split of men and women um, within Juma. And so younger people coming through are mentored by more experienced people. So I'm very, very keen on mentoring. Um, I'm also mentoring a young lady who um, did a startup business in uh, Solihull and I'm mentoring her in her business and you know she um, she's I mean she's only been going about 18 months but she's an inspiration to me too so whilst 
Brilliant. She feels she gets a lot from me because I've been running a business for 21 years. Hers is only 18 months old, but mm -hmm. she's so she's so young. She's so passionate about her business, and I'm actually getting a lot out of mentoring her. Um, mm -hmm. And I think because you know what she's doing for this is um, she her business supplies into um the retail into the into shops and and yeah. the retail sector and of course her business just dried up overnight and so she's improvised now and she's um a, doing a similar thing within a business but she's targeted a different market um and actually her income hasn't been hugely affected because she's right. very quickly thought about how can i get around this and we talked about it and she ran an idea by me and i think amazing you know just do it just try it if it doesn't work it doesn't work but actually it's it's taken off mm. um so yeah so and i i you know do try wherever i can um and and help people um in in other businesses so yeah i'm quite passionate about it because i think we do need to stick together don't we as ladies <laughs> yeah, that's, i mean that's really encouraging to hear and um it's great to hear your stories and um I think uh, whereas IT has traditionally been quite a male-dominated um, sector, it's just really great to see uh, the efforts that are taken. I mean, we do it uh, actively as well in Eastern Europe as well with our staff and promoting uh, women into, into IT roles. So I think it's something we have to keep persevering with and, and yeah. join forces together yeah. to keep that message strong um, yeah. and uh, create the opportunities. Yeah, and it's still um, it's it's still difficult to get more women into into tech. So we have um, STEM ambassadors within Jumal. So we go mm. into schools, colleges, universities. So um, so we've we've got those ambassadors across um, the company to try and sort of help and promote. You know, we take um, we have quite a few graduates we we take in each year. Um, and there has to be a minimum of a 50-50 split um, mm. for women coming in. And, um, you know, some of them, they've just been outstanding. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of what we do. And, you know, we're always offering uh, work experiences whenever the summer. You can tell when it's the work experience season because you just see a number of these little scared young ones all, you know, wandering around the place um, yeah. you know, to get experience. But they have to see what it's like to work um in the real environment and they you know um uh, spending a week with the jumar family they soon get to see that it's not as scary as they think it is and that you know people really look after look after them and 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 show them lots and lots of um of things and what the art of the possible is within mm -hmm. tech because the tech is you know people just think tech is about programming and there's yep. just so much so much you know sort of that they can be exposed to so um hopefully i think that more women in tech will will get a lot easier yeah um moving forward yeah. yeah well thank you so much wendy for joining me in this conversation uh it's been a real pleasure to talk to you um i hope you enjoy the the rest of your week and thank you very much thank you thank you